Today I have the opportunity of sharing some thoughts regarding building codes and construction standards and how all of that fits into our efforts to build resilient communities. And of course that's important to all of us as emergency managers because it seems like our communities back at home are faced with more and more emergencies, disasters, and adverse events every day. So I want to start by talking about a fundamental principle. And that fundamental principle is that we manage hazards in order to minimize risk. Let me repeat that. We manage hazards in order to minimize risk. A lot of people think that, that hazard and risk is the same thing. In fact, we often use those two terms interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. Think of hazard as a dangerous condition, but think of risk as your exposure to that condition. Let me put it into perspective. I'm from Southern California, and I will tell you with absolute certainty, it is hazardous to drive on freeways in and around Los Angeles. But there are certain things that I can do to manage those risks. I can wear my seatbelts. I can drive a car that has anti-lock brakes and has seatbelt tensioners. I can avoid distracted driving. I can drive defensively. And by doing all of those things and managing my, those hazards, I can reduce the risk that I expose myself to. Building codes are tools that help us do those exact same things. And when we apply those, those building codes, we reduce the exposure of our communities to various hazards. Building codes, the best part is that building codes can be applied both before and after disasters, and they continue to make our communities more resilient. We've all heard that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. How important are building codes to the resiliency of our community? How do building codes contribute to our community resilience? We're going to see in just a bit. Let's take a look at some real case situations where um, codes and standards weren't used to help those communities and uh, the, the people that were ultimately affected manage the risks that they were exposed to. Uh, in 1903, in the Iroquois Theater in Chicago, this was a new building. In fact, it was only six weeks old. In this particular case, we had a situation where the building was absolutely full. Every seat in the house was taken, but that wasn't enough. They sold more tickets, and they had a standing room only crowd. Every aisle and every seat in the stairway had individuals there to watch the performance. A painted canvas that was hung up above the stage was ignited by sparks from a hot arc light. That, that fire fell to the stage, and uh, before anybody realized it, uh, the, the situation grew out of control. Um, in a 15-minute event, 15 minutes, the flames had extended beyond the stage and found their way into the seating gallery. And in those 15 minutes, 602 people died in 15 minutes. What are some of the things that contributed to that particular situation? And let's take a look at how building codes could have made a difference. Some of the contributing factors. As I mentioned, it was a standing room only crowd. The capacity of that theater was 1,602 people. Afterwards, they estimated that the audience was between 2,100 and 2,200 people. So there were people blocking every aisle. There were people in the stairwells. Exit doors did not swing outward. They actually swung inward. So when the flames hit the stage, and the fire was projected into the audience, people panicked. And so as they ran towards the exit doors, they couldn't push the doors outward because they were swinging inward, so people were crushed. 
There were some openings behind the stage. They were probably there to facilitate bringing in large set decorations, equipment, and so forth. When the fire erupted on the stage, some of the performers immediately ran out the back doors. But when they opened the doors, what ended up happening is gusts of wind blew the flames underneath the curtain like a bellows. It immediately engaged the audience. Power was lost. Everything went black. Exits and stairways from upper floors and mezzanine levels were blocked. So people panicked. From the upper floors, since they couldn't get out, they jumped over the balcony. After that, people continued to jump, and the only survivors from the upper floors made it because they were landing on bodies down below. In the aftermath of that 15-minute disaster, they found bodies six deep on that particular level. So what were some of the lessons that were learned, and how did building codes evolve to see to it that that doesn't happen again? Well, for one thing, as I mentioned, the exit doors opened inward. These days, for all assemblies, including this one, where we're in right now, exit doors have to open outward. Occupant loads absolutely have to be enforced, which they are today. Emergency lighting and special uh, panic hardware are applied to doors to facilitate exiting. Let's talk about earthquakes. In uh, 2010, the uh, earthquake that affected Haiti in the Dominican Republic um, occurred. That was a 7.0 magnitude earthquake. That earthquake hit a community that did not have the benefit of strong building codes to help them manage that type of disaster. Residential losses were about a quarter of a million structures. And then commercial losses were an additional 30,000 losses on top of that. This resulted in a lot of homelessness and displacement. But the biggest problem was the loss of lives. That singular earthquake resulted in between 100,000 to 160,000 deaths, all from one earthquake. Let's compare that to an experience, or a couple of experiences, that we've had here in California, recent earthquakes. I'm going to start with the Loma Prieta earthquake. That was close in magnitude. The earthquake in Haiti was a 7.0 magnitude earthquake. The Loma Prieta earthquake was a 6.9 magnitude earthquake. It actually had a slightly larger peak ground acceleration, whereas the Haiti earthquake had a peak ground acceleration of 0.5 g. The uh, acceleration measured from the Loma Prieta earthquake was 0.65 g, so it was slightly larger. But the death toll from Loma Prieta was only 63. Compare that to the roughly 160,000 people that died in Haiti. Let's take a look at the Northridge earthquake. That occurred in 1994. That was a 6.7 magnitude earthquake. That earthquake actually had the highest peak ground acceleration ever measured. The peak ground acceleration there was 1.82 g. In that particular case, the death toll was 57. Clearly, building codes make a difference. The advancements from what we learned post-disaster result in our ability to make our building codes better and better. In fact, part of the International Code Council, ICC's mission, is to provide the very best codes, standards, products, and services to everybody who is concerned with the safety and welfare of the built environment. That includes emergency managers, just like yourself. There are opportunities for all of us to be involved in code development, and when we learn things from disasters, we can make the next generation of codes even that much better. Significant changes to model building codes, let's talk about hurricanes. Hurricane Andrew was a Category 5 hurricane that affected the state of Florida. In 1992, 650,000 homes were damaged and 175,000 people were displaced and made homeless. As a result, the state of Florida learned its lesson. It took steps 
to bolster its building code standards, to see to it that special steps would be taken to address storm and wind-driven effects so that this would not happen again. In the 10 years following Hurricane Andrew, wind-driven damage was reduced by 72% in the state. Do codes make a difference? You bet they do. Community resilience results when we take those codes and lessons learned and apply them during the recovery phase so that the new buildings that make up our communities don't suffer those same experiences again. We have to manage our hazards to minimize our future risk. Talking about hurricanes, Florida was hit by another Category 5 hurricane. We've all seen this particular picture. In this particular case, building codes made a big difference. This home was built with newer standards and new ideas in place. It had an elevated footprint so it could avoid the 14-foot storm surge that it experienced. Reinforced concrete pile foundations established a firm base so that this building did not wash away like others. The entire roof, every roof rafter and the roof sheathing was anchored to the building so that the wind could not rip it off. Impact-resistant glazing was used so that glass didn't fracture, wind could not get in, and that home could not be blown apart from the inside. These are some of the things that we learn and we apply and put them to use in future building codes. So how are building codes developed and why are our building codes so good? In part, as I mentioned, it's because the International Code Council's mission is to provide the very best building codes, products, and services for people who really do get involved and care about the built community. Everybody in this room has the opportunity to get involved as well. As emergency managers, you all learn lessons from every emergency that you experience. And if you believe that there are opportunities where the codes can be made better, you can participate. So what is that process? How are the model codes developed? We start every three-year cycle by taking a look at the current edition of the building code. In this particular example, let's take the 2015 International Building Code. Anybody that has an idea that can make those model codes better, ICC welcomes it. They come to us in the form of code change proposals. Every single code change proposal is eventually vetted through a public process, public hearings, in which a panel of industry experts takes a look at those proposals, evaluates them, and compares them to what's currently in the building code. They vote, and the outcome of their vote starts the process. Then, through a public comment period, other individuals, individuals right here in this room, can share their ideas and thoughts on how the codes can be improved as well. The results of that vetting process from that panel of experts and all of the public comments that are shared from individuals that care about the codes, care about the resilience of their communities, are combined. And then they're voted upon by all of the governmental members that enforce the codes throughout the country. Governmental members do not have a financial interest in products or code standards. They care about their communities. And so they vote, and ultimately the outcome becomes the next edition of the international codes. A similar process occurs for the state and local codes because various regions may have concerns that, that don't make their way into or need to be bolstered beyond what's in the model codes. Seismic concerns may be important to the western states. Wind-driven uh, effects from storms and hurricanes may affect other parts of the country. And of course, ignition-resistant construction is of importance to anybody in the wildland-urban interface. In a similar process, after the model codes are developed, state and regional areas can develop their own codes for application in their regions. So, we talk about resiliency. The International Code Council considers the definition 
of community resiliency as the ability to prepare and plan for, to adopt and absorb, and to successfully adapt to any adverse condition. And indeed, virtually every adverse condition that can affect a building is found somewhere in the building codes. So we manage hazards to reduce risk. And building codes take virtually every conceivable hazard that our community, through our buildings, can experience, and they find ways to manage those risks so that those of us that use those buildings are not exposed unduly to unsafe situations. But I do want to remind people, codes are only effective if they are used properly. Building codes are tools, and just like any other tool, if you leave that tool in the tool chest, it is not put to good use. FEMA estimated the effects of Hurricane Andrew, and as a result of rather ineffective application of codes and standards, FEMA considered that the damage that resulted from the lack of that enforcement accounted for a full one quarter of the $16 billion in reported insured losses. That's huge. And then finally, I want to remind people that stronger and more resilient buildings will result the more we apply those codes. The National Institute of Building Sciences, NIBS, performed a study and they estimated that for every $1 spent in preventive and proactive measures, those which are applied to our communities through building codes, result in $6 in reduced recovery cost expenditures. So I'll pose a question to the emergency managers. Where would you rather have your money spent? In preventive and proactive steps? Or would you rather spend your money picking up the pieces afterwards? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I talked very briefly about the model code development, and I followed that by talking about adoption of state and local codes. In most parts of the country, the model codes uh, merely start off the process. They start the foundation of what ultimately becomes the adopted code for that state, county, or, or municipal jurisdiction. Uh, your communities at home most likely have a local version of the code. And uh, on a cycle that tends to follow the adoption of the model codes, um, there's a similar process uh, by which those local codes are adopted. So um, as an example, uh, the state of California uh, adopts its model codes and uh, immediately thereafter, and by state law in California, 180 days thereafter, uh, every local jurisdiction has the opportunity to adopt a local code. So as an emergency manager, if there are certain emergencies that you believe uh, should be uh, looked at and additional provisions put in the code, there is an opportunity to do that. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned earlier, ignition resistant construction for communities located in the wildland urban interface area. Uh, if your community or if you as an emergency manager deal with issues in the wildland urban interface, you might want to be involved in your local community. Find out, are, is our community merely taking the model code and enforcing that? Or are we taking a look at our community and determining, are there special hazards that we really need to mitigate? And should we take the model code language and amend it or adjust it to be better suited for our community? Because if we do adjust it slightly, we're doing a better job at managing those hazards, thereby minimizing the risk to our community. It's very easy to uh, determine what codes are applicable to a new building. If anybody here wanted to construct a new building today, that would be the code that is currently being enforced. Uh, 
But um, in order to learn more about the buildings that we currently uh, live, work, and play in, uh, that very question is a good one. What codes were in effect back when this building was built? The answer to that is um, most local building departments are required to keep permit records. Uh, and uh, by going to the local jurisdiction, uh, an individual can generally find out what year a particular building was built. They can certainly determine what year was the permit issued for the building in question. Once you ascertain what year that building was built, or at least what year the permit was issued, you can generally go back a couple of years and determine which code was uh, being enforced and what was applicable at that time. Once you do that, uh, most jurisdictions actually have an archival copy of those codes, so you can take a look and find out how much protection was built into the building that I'm living in or working in right now? How safe am I? Are there certain things that I should be aware of so that I can take certain steps to protect myself? But in general, by working backwards in that manner, you can determine what codes were in effect when my building was designed and constructed. I'll start by saying most communities actually have um, defined uh, local responsibility for which department or agency um, may have some share of the responsibility of enforcing those standards. Um, whether or not defensible space, whether or not uh, brush clearance or fuel modification is something that has to be uh, handled and observed on a regular basis is something that most communities, certainly communities that are developed within the wildland urban interface area, uh, these are things that are enforced uh, on a fairly uh, regular basis. And if the level of risk is pretty high, um, those municipalities probably do a pretty good job. For the most part, it falls to the fire department through their annual inspection programs to deal with uh, brush clearance and defensible space, but I'm going to go a little bit further and I'm going to say that the responsibility goes beyond just reliance upon the municipal agencies to knock on people's doors and say, you know what, you haven't done your job. You haven't managed the, the fuel and the vegetation around your property the way you're supposed to. I would say it's actually a community responsibility. Municipal resources um, are always stretched pretty thin, and municipalities will do the best job that they can. But we all have, have responsibilities ourselves. We all have duties. And I would say that if you see a situation in your community which you know has developed to a point where it is contrary to what the codes, what the best practices would dictate, then as a community, you should get together and do something. Uh, if it's one local piece of property, then maybe a knock on that person's door um, or through the code enforcement department if you don't want to get into a confrontational um, situation uh, might be enough to initiate um, some action to remediate that problem. If you see a wide-scale problem, because lots and lots of people or portions of the community have neglected their duties and their responsibilities, maybe uh, collaborating with and getting together with the community to start a program to do something uh, is the way to do it. But I think that the important thing in terms of the question regarding enforcement of the codes, how does it get done? Who's responsible for it? I think the most important thing is to stop and ponder what happens if it is not done? What kind of risk are we exposing ourselves to? And am I going to wait until somebody else takes action to force that to meet the codes and standards? This gets right back to what I said. Building codes are great tools. They help us manage our hazards, but they're only useful if we put those tools to good use.
The best way that I can answer that would be to draw your attention to ISO, the Insurance Services Organization. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, local municipalities um, get a score, and it's based on how well certain key parts of that municipality um, rate or comply with certain um, best practice standards that the insurance industry would like to see. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising. The insurance industry is motivated by things that will reduce their loss experience. And so as a result, if they can encourage uh, various departments to take certain actions within your communities to see to it that there is less exposure to risk, they'll probably experience um, a, a smaller loss uh, experience. And so as a result, I can tell you um, two departments that I work with very closely that are part of the ISO rating. Uh, one is the building department, one's the fire department. And depending on um, how well those departments function within your community, it can have a rather significant uh, effect on that community's ISO rating. Um, the way ISO works is uh, communities get a score from one to 10, uh, one being the best and 10 being not so good. Uh, as a community, it is highly desirable to rate a one. And to get that score, um, there's a combination of things that are evaluated. One being, is your community applying and enforcing the best most current codes. If your community is not, because it is enforcing older codes, then that's taken into consideration. How highly educated is the staff for that department? What types of degrees do they have? How many certifications do their inspectors, do their plan checkers have? For their fire departments, what class fire department is it? Is it a class one fire department? Um, do they have an annual inspection program uh, that takes a look at vegetation management and things of that nature? Um, and so, to directly answer that question, do I know of studies uh, and what the effects are in terms of the insurance rates? Um, I haven't actually seen the results of those um, ratings and what effect, what direct effect it has on the cost of an insurance policy, but I will tell you that the primary purpose of creating that rating is to create a tool so that insurance companies have a basis for setting the rates the way they do.